Hey folks, good afternoon. Since everybody is uh, so pleasantly already situated, let's try to get started. For those of you I don't know, I'm Glenn Hubbard, an economist in the school. I am the, also the faculty director of the Chazen Institute. This is one of our global markets preview update series. I told our guests that I've got my pen in my pocket. I'm ready to leave with investment tips. Uh, I hope you are too. <laughs> Uh, this series is designed to uh, have conversations about the current economy and markets. And of course, there's not much going on, is there? Inflation, recession, Ukraine, whether certain politicians will accept the results of elections, market microstructure problems in everything from UK gilts to even United States treasuries and mutual funds. This is a pretty interesting time to have a conversation, and I look forward to having it with our guest of honor, uh, Abby Joseph Cohen. I am really proud to say that Abby has joined Columbia Business School as a professor of professional practice. In some sense, that's new. Abby is just now a professor of practice. But in some sense, she's doing what she has graciously been doing for us in teaching. She and uh, our mutual colleague, Pierre Yared, have been teaching a class together on the future of the global economy for several years now and will continue, uh, will continue to do so. Abby probably needs little introduction to you. You've no doubt seen her on uh, what my kids used to call when they were little daddy TV, which is investment shows and, and things like that. Uh, she is also on the Barron's Roundtable on Saturdays. I always eagerly look for uh, Abby's advice and others. A long-standing partner at Goldman Sachs where she had many storied roles uh, in investments in the Global Markets uh, Institute. Uh, outside of her uh, many successful roles in financial services, she has uh, always served well uh, both as an economist and as a charitable person, being on the board of the Brookings Institution and the Jewish Theological uh, Seminary, uh, and also uh, Weill Cornell. Uh, it is a real treat to have Abby with us today. I can't think of a better person to have a conversation on global markets and the global economy than Abby Joseph Cohen. So join me in welcoming Abby. So Abby, before we get started, um, what is the course you teach with Pierre? Just as a quick uh, thumbnail for folks here in case they're interested. Well, before I respond to that question, Glenn, um, you left out one important aspect of my Columbia experience, and that is you were the agent that got me here. Um, it was uh, during uh, Glenn's time as dean of the business school uh, that we had conversations about whether I'd like to come and spend time at Columbia. So I want to thank you for opening this opportunity for me so many years ago when I began to teach with Pierre, and it has been an absolute pleasure uh, and so when I took the step of retiring from Goldman Sachs, um, coming here on a full-time basis was just a natural, natural step for me. Uh, the course with Pierre has evolved over time. Um, and so while the title of the course hasn't changed over the last nine years or something like that, uh, the topics that we cover have changed. So when we first developed the program about a decade ago, the biggest issue was the financial crisis, the global financial crisis of 2007, 8, 9, et cetera. Um, and we have changed it so dramatically in recent years to reflect whatever we think the issues are, but not necessarily the issues of the week, rather the big important structural issues uh, that are out there. Um, this past year when we taught the course, uh, we spent time on the pandemic, not just to talk about the impact of COVID per se, but how do you model something like that? What do you do when supply chains are disrupted? What do you do um, when there is creation of more inequality within countries and between countries as a consequence of that. Uh, we have also looked at a variety of other issues, uh, but what we always come down to is this. The economic theory behind how do you analyze what's happening 
in the global economy is always the starting point, and then we add on to it some of the important changes from a structural standpoint and sometimes from a cyclical standpoint as well. Well, anytime I hear economic theory is the starting point, tears well up in my eyes. Thank you for that. So before we dive into the substance of all that's going on in the world, I want to ask you a process question first. How do you approach thinking about markets when you're trying to devise your own outlooks or even individual security picks? Uh, are you looking at types of economic events? Is it from a worldview? I know you're a very data-driven person. Uh, I am indeed data-driven, and um, I would say that I'm something of a data nerd. Um, I always start with the facts, just the facts, uh, and then try to think through what various models will tell me about it. Um, my basic training is in economics and computer science, um, math, econ, and so on. And so that is, from a process standpoint, my starting point, but that's not where I end. Um, where I, I think my work has been differentiated from others in uh, on Wall Street over the years has been that I start with a model, think of me as first an economics quant and then a financial markets quant, and the first question I always ask is, is there something wrong with the data? Are the models specified properly or not? And I'm going to give you one example. Um, a few years ago, I wrote um, an article which is now part of the CFA curriculum um, that basically has the title of Aristotle and investment decision making. And you may say, what the heck did this Greek philosopher have to do uh, with investment decision making? And I know nothing about the Greek language, so I'm going to paraphrase something from Aristotle, which basically is, you may think you have enough facts to understand a situation, but if you don't understand the difference between facts and knowledge, you've missed it. And that, to me, is really quite critical. You know, I think about what goes on in the markets from a day-to-day -day basis. Something gets released by the Commerce Department at 8.30 in the morning, and there's this instant analysis. And that instant analysis is usually not very helpful in, in any way. Uh, and, and so my work has been, uh, pardon me, this is not working terribly well. Is this better? Does that sound better up there? Yeah, OK, great. Um, so you know, what I do in my work is, obviously, I'm familiar with the data items that get released, but I try to put it in a broader construct of how does this really fit into how the economy works? Um, and to get back to the very beginning of your question, my market analysis always begins with economic analysis. I think that that is the foundational element of it. Doesn't mean I then don't add on market-specific developments, because I do. Um, I think there is so much uh, information that one can get uh, from uh, looking at flows of funds, thinking about valuation models, and so on. But for me, that is the next phase of the analysis. I want to, that's very helpful. I, I want to start with um, what's probably the macro topic that's uppermost in people's minds here, which is uh, inflation. And of course, we, when um, Abby and I were in grad school, that was a very present topic. Uh, it has not been for some time because the US economy and world economy were in what many economists had called a great moderation. Inflation had been a non-problem. Uh, Alan Greenspan, when he was chair of the Federal Reserve, used to say that uh, inflation isn't a problem when nobody's talking about it. He, he really didn't have in mind a particular target. Well, we're all talking about it, and it is a problem. And in fact, the first time in years that I've consistently agreed with Larry Summers, which has caused me to question <laughs> my, my view. So I want to I start. Um, with just a factual question, what, what do you think about the outlook for inflation? How, how long are we going to uh, see elevated inflation? Uh, it depends how we define elevated. Is, is this now sounding better to everyone? Yay. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the period of low inflation that lasted more than 20 years, closer to 30 years, is over. And what we have to recognize is that in many ways, it was the anomaly. We are now back to a situation where the economic cycle in which 
when there's more demand than supply and so on, we're going to see higher prices, not just for goods, but also in wages. So that's point number one. Point number two, I believe that we have now seen a step up in inflation. So depending upon which your favorite inflation metric may be, whether it is the implicit deflator of PCE, personal consumption expenditures, that the Fed likes, or you prefer CPI, or whatever it is you, you, you like to look at, there has been an upward step in it over the last couple of years. And I don't think we're going to see a downward step anytime soon. But around that higher step, I do believe we're going to see fluctuation. And we've already begun to see it in some categories. Very importantly, we're beginning to see that things are calming down in housing, which includes rent. Uh, we've seen that there is a calming, at least for the time being, in energy. Uh, and so on. So I believe that we all have to get accustomed to the idea that the extremely low inflation and the weirdly low interest rates that came with it around the world, that period is over. Before we go further into that, I want to ask you, uh, why should we care about inflation? Uh, inflation is critical in several different ways. I'm sure everyone here has had a little bit of a sticker shock, uh, whether it's going into the supermarket or, in my case, going onto the Fresh Direct website and saying, how much do they increase that container of Tide? Um, it really is off-putting. Um, and particularly for people at lower income levels, it becomes problematic in terms of people needing to make trade-offs. From an economic policy standpoint, what we believe, and I think uh, Glenn and Larry Summers would agree with this, um, is that when inflation is problematic, it has a negative impact on economic growth. Um, we cannot reach potential economic growth when inflation is uh, causing disruption. Um, I was working at the Fed um, when they were trying to figure out how to handle that inflationary period of the 70s and 80s. And one of the things that was taken as a given, uh, and we're seeing it now, is that you have to slam on the brakes. Because inflation, if you don't get it under control, just cascades and gets worse. Um, and so the argument was that you need to slam on the brakes, raise interest rates, slow down the economy. Now, whether that's going to be as effective now as it used to be, we can discuss. I happen to think it will not be as effective because the sources of inflation are not the sources that fit nicely into the economic modeling uh, that, we, that we grew up with. Um, uh, so for example, if you have inflation coming from uh, an energy disruption, or you have inflation coming from the supply chain disruptions uh, related to the pandemic, uh, or if you have inflation coming from some other unusual source, raising interest rates aren't going to do it. Why? Raising interest rates alone will have an impact on what? Things that are credit sensitive, buying a house because of mortgages, buying a car, because most people need to finance those purchases and so on. So raising interest rates, the mechanism there is obvious. But if you raise interest rates, it doesn't have a direct impact on energy prices, an indirect impact perhaps. But we need to, to recognize that there are going to be some other aspects to getting this inflation under control. Well, let me follow up on exactly that. So let's break it up into two parts. Partly it's the supply disruptions that you mm -hmm. referred to some in energy markets, supply chains, and so on. And then it's demand. So I, I know in my own head, I think if I were at the Fed, I would ask myself, okay, there's getting inflation down to, say, four if we were to resolve all the supply mm -hmm. issues. And then the question is, what's the cost of going to two? So if you break it up, how important do you think the supply factors are, whether they're energy prices, supplies, chain issues? How, how big of a deal is that in current inflation? Right now, I think the supply chain issues are absolutely essential uh, in two ways. Uh, first of all, because there's inadequate supply 
And secondly, for some bad actors out there, they use it as an excuse uh, for raising their prices. Um, and you know, I, I shouldn't call them bad actors. They're you know, optimizing their profits uh, and so on. They're, they're maximizing their profits. Uh, but um, there are, I think, many cases that we can all point to where when inflation expectations broadly begin to move up, there's not much pushback. And if you think about why Paul Volcker uh, and the Fed of the 70s and 80s needed to impose such draconian measures on the U.S. economy to get the inflation under control, one of the critical elements was that inflation expectations had been baked into the cake. If you think, as a consumer, that prices are just going to go higher next month, so why not spend more this month? And as a business person, if you think your cost of goods sold will be higher next month than now, you're going to manufacture more this month and stick it into inventory. Um, and so you get this uh, dynamic uh, that basically encourages the inflation to go forward. And furthermore, in the 70s and 80s, there were so many uh, inflation escalators in terms of, uh, for example, cost of living adjustments in union contracts. Um, a lot of workers felt kind of indifferent as to whether there was inflation because they knew that their labor contracts would protect them. And there were uh, basically cost plus contracts were very common in U.S. industry at that point. So the businesses didn't really care if they weren't controlling their cost of goods sold well because they could just charge the end customer more. Um, and these are things that are not yet here. And what, one of the things the Fed is trying to do now in 2022 is to keep us from the point where inflation expectations become part of the dynamic of why inflation is hard to get under control. I want to make one more point, uh, Glenn, if I may, and that is when we talk about supply, it's not just stuff, right? It's not just the stuff. It's also the workers. And one of the things that has been so interesting to me uh, to follow in this period has been that there has been a shortage of workers. Uh, some of this is demographic, uh, the aging of the baby boomers uh, who are leaving the workforce. Um, then there was not as much uh, a lower birth rate uh, after the boomers. Uh, and now, very importantly, what's happened in terms of our flow of immigrants uh, into the United States. Um, I know that the data changed this morning, but up until a few months ago, we had twice as many open jobs as we had available workers in the United States. Think about that for a moment. Um, at, at, at the worst point um, this summer, there were about 11 million open jobs and only about five, five and a half million available workers. And the shortage of workers is all over the income spectrum. Um, I know that there are some people who like to talk about the inadequacy of people at the lower end of the income uh, spectrum, uh, the immigrants who are not able to uh, come into the country uh, most recently um, in service, low, low in service and, and so on. But as somebody who's concerned um, about long-term economic growth and research and development and keeping us uh, you know, at the, you know, at the successful end of how we're doing uh, in our global competitiveness, the thing that I'm also struck by has been the dramatic um, downturn um, in immigration at the higher end of the income spectrum as well. Um, this began about five or six years ago, um, basically not seeing as many uh, students uh, coming into the United States, those student visas, they're still positive, but the growth rate is not what it was. Uh, and then many of the people who come here for tertiary education, particularly in the sciences, are leaving, which they never did before. Uh, and this is problematic. I'll give you one more factoid, if I may. And that is um, that 65% of the people in the United States who are working, uh, PhDs in applied science and engineering, these people are immigrants to the United States, 65%. And if we make our country less attractive to immigrants, 
um, at the high end of education and at the lower end of education, we're doing ourselves a disservice, in my view. Agreed. I, I want to take you from supply to demand, though, for inflation. Let's suppose that we could wave a wand and the supply factors are fixed. How much demand is the Fed going to need to destroy if we take Chair Powell at his word that in the near future, whatever that means, inflation should be 2 percent measured by the PCE deflator? Um, I don't know. Um, but it's going to be a lot. And I'll just parrot what they say at the Fed, and that is we will be data driven. We will be watching. And the thing that I know about the Fed staff is they'll be very careful in terms of segregating by sector. So they'll be looking at the credit sensitive sectors, that is the interest rate sensitive sectors, uh, to get a sense of you know, what the impact has been. They'll also be looking at um, uh, some of the other pieces of the U.S. economy. Keep in mind that the industrial sector, the business sector of the U.S., is typically not as interest rate sensitive as is the consumer sector. You know, it's mainly housing and autos and so on. But if a business feels that its capacity utilization rate is too high and they really need to build more capacity, they will do it, typically regardless of uh, the capital cost. You know, I'm not getting into the capital markets aspect here. I'm going to take of, you there. Of, of those minute. companies it, that have yeah. trouble getting capital, but let, let, let's just, I'm going to give the simplistic explanation right now. But one thing the Fed is going to have to track, of course, is the role that these higher interest rates have had in boosting the dollar higher. Now, as conversing with Betsy earlier, who's going on a foreign trip um, and will benefit from the strong dollar, Congratulations, do some shopping. Um, but if you are a US company that wants to export into the rest of the world and you're doing it at a time that the dollar is high, you have lost some competitiveness. Now, for the US, this is not as big an issue as it is for some other countries because most of what we export is actually kind of value added, right? Um, uh, I'm, I'm just throw this out iPhones are typically not competing on the basis of price, right? Um, uh, other branded products or other high-end advanced manufactured products, um, there can be some pricing flexibility for those companies. But for those U.S. companies that are trying to sell things where they, there is competition based on price, this higher dollar is going to create a problem. So that is the other uh, mechanism by which these higher interest rates slow down U.S. economic growth. So what should the Fed be looking at to figure out how it's doing in that demand? Is, is it about watching the unemployment rate? What, what's on their dashboard? Yeah, um, they have a complicated dashboard right now, Glenn, as, as you well know. Um, and I think for the time being, um, they are looking at things like um, I'm going to say GDP, but it's not the GDP that everybody looks at headline, right? It's GDP Xing out inventory adjustment. They're looking at basically GDP from current production. They're looking at industrial production uh, as measured by uh, the Fed on a monthly basis. So they're trying to get a sense of you know, how many, on how many cylinders is the economy working, number one. Number two, they'll be tracking the labor markets very, very carefully. Um, when Janet Yellen was uh, Fed chair, we knew that this was an extremely high priority for her. Her expertise is in labor economics. There are still people on this board who are very concerned about the health of the labor markets. They'll be monitoring that as well. And then, of course, they're looking at all of these different inflation metrics, recognizing that some of them are lagging indicators, not leading indicators, and some of them are beyond the Fed's control. So for example, a lot of commodity prices, uh, of course, are set globally. Um, and some of them are set because of, let's call it artificial constraints on supply. Uh, just think about what OPEC announced uh, just a couple of days ago. And the Fed can't directly control that. They can have an indirect impact by slowing things down, et cetera. Uh, but there are some things that are really out of their control. They monitor all of that. Um, when I was a junior person at the Fed, I was involved in preparing some of those briefing books and so on. Um, and um, they, they try to take in this very broad picture. Uh, but I, I think that they 
will also be doing something uh, that is different from when I was being trained. Um, and that is a heavy focus on the global economy. Um, when I was at the Fed, um, and I had this conversation with Ben Bernanke not that long ago, when I was at the Fed and I was in the research division, about 10% of the staff focused on global economy. Anybody want to guess what the current percentage of the Fed's research staff now focuses on global economy? It used to be 10%. Any, any guess? Yeah. That's great, 65%. Did you know that? That's okay. Excellent. I have to be careful with all of you. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's 65%. It's They're looking at what's happening in the rest of the world. And let's keep in mind the following. This inflation problem is a global problem. Um, we're looking at inflation numbers around the world that are as, a, as high, or in some cases higher, than they are in the United States. So it's not just a function of US policy, it's a function of policy elsewhere as well. So on, I'm going to take you to capital markets, because you, you mentioned that, uh, in particular, just equity and bond prices. You know, One of the classes I teach in the MBA program is entrepreneurial finance. And a few years ago, I was reminding students that if you have tech businesses that have hockey stick type cash flows and you have trivial discount rates, those are very valuable businesses relative to standard businesses. But don't mistake a capital market for being a genius. If you change the term structure of interest rates, that can change. Now, that has changed, but it's not just a story about tech stocks. What should we be looking for as the whole yield curve is higher? Uh, walk us through your outlook for bonds over the next couple of years and then equities. We have another three hours, right? Yeah, exactly. We have all afternoon. Okay. They can have another lunch. Excellent, excellent. So um, as I mentioned at the outset, um, I always start with models. Um, and so I'm always looking at valuation models uh, for the S&P 500, for example, um, or for other market indices, but also by sector and also individually. And the thing about uh, dividend discount models or you know, other you know, CAPM related models is they are so incredibly sensitive to interest rates and inflation. And I think many of the people who misused these models over the last couple of years who said, oh, this S&P is still so, so cheap, these were the people in January, uh, they were using then current inflation and then current interest rates, which were unsustainable. Um, and I think that the people who uh, were more likely to get it right uh, were the people who said, I'm not going to look at current inflation and rates, but rather try to guess at what those inflation and rates will be going forward. Um, and while the shape of the yield curve does matter for equity valuation, the one um, point that matters the most is basically the intermediates, because that's where uh, companies borrow. So the 10-year? Typically the 10-year, the average corporate, um, and I'm not talking about low grade, but I'm, the average reasonable company um, borrows at an average duration of five to seven years. So 10 years is not a bad thing to be looking at. Um, and, and so we have seen that the 10-year has moved up. There's been this flattening of the curve, um, which says a whole bunch of things about inflation expectations and so on. My feeling is that given how serious the Fed is and how serious um, other central banks are, um, I think that those yields are going to move up more uh, from current levels. I don't expect the horrible numbers that we saw in the 70s and 80s of double-digit numbers. You know, um, you know, mortgage rates at one point were 18 to 24 percent. Mortgage rates, not credit card rates, mortgage rates. Um, and, and so do I think we're going there? Absolutely not. Do I think we can move up another <coughs> percentage or two? Uh, yes, yes, I do. Um, and I also think it's important to recognize that one reason yields have not moved up more than they have, intermediate and long, is the strength of the dollar. Now, it's kind of chicken and egg, right? Um, is the dollar as strong as it is because foreign investors are buying U.S. Treasuries? Or is the yield on U.S. Treasuries as low as it is because the dollar is strong? Um, take your pick. 
Um, you can argue it in a couple of different ways. Um, when I take a look at flows of funds, and I see that the dollar is at record highs relative to the pound, relative to euro, relative to the yen, and so on, it basically says to me, ask yourself the following question, as Aristotle would have done, and that is, is this sustainable? Just because you know what the number is doesn't mean it's right or it's going to stay in place. Um, and, and I would suggest uh, that with regard to the currency, um, I don't think the dollar is going to get too much stronger on a sustained basis. I think it's more likely uh, to move lower. It'll still be strong, but it will move somewhat lower. With regard to interest rates, um, which are so critical to equity valuation, I think that they can move up a little bit. And so here's the question. Arithmetically, arithmetically, we all know that if yields go up, the valuation of stocks goes down. Glenn stated it very well before. You know, when you have high growth companies and very low interest rates, that looks great for their valuation. What happens, however, when those interest rates go up? If you just apply the model simplistically, higher interest rates mean lower stock prices. But how low? And here the question then becomes, will there be a recession? Will there be a decline in earnings. If you think what the Fed has done by raising interest rates is just tap on the brakes, not slamming on the brakes, and economic growth will continue and earnings growth will continue, albeit at a slower pace, it may very well be that you have a situation where bond prices go down further from these levels, but equity prices can rise. And that, to me, is Part of the explanation of the last two days, not that I want to get into short-term forecasting, but the other thing that happened by the end of Friday of last week is that the valuation of the S&P 500 was the most attractive it had been in the last two or three years. So the combination of attractive valuation plus a catalyst, i.e., oops, we're, maybe we're not going into a recession, maybe earnings will continue to grow. That helps explain, in my view, uh, what, what, what's going on. Now, that was sort of an overall look, but you started with such an interesting question, and that is those companies whose projections look like a hockey sticks, or as we used to refer to them, a Gompertz curve. Um, you can check your math textbooks for that one. Um, and, and what you basically see is that there is a distinction within the market right now. Um, many of the companies, the stocks uh, that are doing well, are the ones that were more value-oriented, the ones that got too cheap relative to the others. Um, some of them are mid-cap rather than large-cap. Where's the biggest damage been? The so-called FANG stocks that were the high flyers um, a, a year or two ago. And along with that, because there's such a strong correlation, has been the FANG stocks, and crypto. And I'm just going to stop We're going to come back to crypto, I promise, because <laughs> I have a hunch on your mind, less on mine, but we will come back to crypto. But you use the R word, and so I was going to use it later okay. for recession. How likely is a recession? If you look at just a little bit of monetary tightening history, history wouldn't be kind to the notion that the Fed can do this very carefully calibrated soft landing you described. It is possible. It's highly unlikely. Are we going to see a recession in 2023? If so, is it shallow? Is it deep? Is it long-lasting? What do you think? Um, again, I'm going to be honest and say I don't know for sure, but I'll tell you what I am assuming. Um, and my forecast is that we will avoid recession, even though I know that what the Fed is trying to do is really hard. Right? It's, it's harder than landing a plane on, on an aircraft carrier. The, the precision uh, that's involved in terms of tracking everything that's going on in the economy and applying just the right amount of pressure and knowing when to release that pressure is going to be extremely difficult. Uh, but I, I give the likelihood of avoiding recession, um, I, I give that a somewhat higher probability uh, than other people in the economics profession uh, for the following reason. 
um, most importantly, because of the consumer sector in the US. Consumers are in good shape. Now, I know that this does not apply to every household. Um, uh, we, can, we can discuss inequality if, if, if you wish. But if we take a look at the median household in the United States, what we see is that their debt level is actually at pretty low levels. Uh, if we look at monthly debt repayments right now, relative to dis disposable personal income, inflation adjusted, it's at the lowest level we've seen in years. Um, that suggests to me that things are affordable uh, for, for these households. In addition, the employment situation is great. Um, all of these uh, available jobs, and we're seeing that wages are going up. I view that increase in wages as a good thing, not a bad thing. I know that there are some who say, oh gosh, wages are going up, that's inflationary. I look at a situation where for 30 years, the median family income adjusted for inflation actually went down because in wages were not rising. Um, that to me is problematic. Um, that to me basically said to so many people, where's the American dream that I could do better uh, I could do better than my parents, my children's generation can do better than I. And I think that actually has helped contribute in an unfortunate way to the political divisiveness um, in the country. So I, I view the, uh, the rise in wages as a good thing. The bottom line for me is I think the consumer sector is going to help keep us out of recession. Let me touch on one other thing in monetary policy markets where we change the channel to something else. The monetary policy pivot in the U.S. came, shall we say, late. Uh, and so the question is, why? And what do you think that pivot is going to expose? So Warren Buffett you know, famously said, you don't know who's swimming naked until the tide goes out. And you mentioned earlier global factors. If we were having this conversation in an emerging economy, the Fed's actions are exporting problems there. So how do you, why'd the pivot happen late? And what are these collateral damages, if any? Yeah, um, the, the pivot happened incredibly late, and not just here, but everywhere else. And by the way, an appropriate pivot has still not occurred in some other places. Um, one of the things that to me was so bizarre, and um, I, I was frankly, as a forecaster, surprised it lasted so long, was the situation where there were so many developed economies that had negative interest rates. Not just negative real interest rates, but negative nominal interest rates. Um, the implications for banks, the implications for the financial markets in those places was, was really a, a head scratcher to me. Uh, and I think the fact that so many countries with whom we trade, and I'm not talking about the emerging nations, I'm talking about the countries in Europe and talking about Japan and so on, the fact that they had such incredibly low interest rates made it more difficult for the Fed to say it's time for us to raise rates. Had they been working, um, thinking about the U.S. as a closed system, just thinking about the U.S. economy by itself, <coughs> I believe interest rates would have gone up much sooner um, than they did. You know, think about the 65 percent of the investment staff at the Fed that does global, um, if those people weren't there, um, I, I think we would have seen um, higher interest rates. Um, there were so many concerns about whether the Fed wanted to risk disrupting other nations, other nations that had economies far weaker than ours. You know, keep in mind that while the United States was growing after the financial crisis, Europe enjoyed two more recessions. Um, Japan uh, was doing so poorly until recently. Uh, and, and I think that that was a critical reason. And I also think that um, uh, central bankers were asleep at the switch uh, because they were taking advantage of the extremely low inflation instead of thinking about how that inflation might change through any number of, of possible channels. They just kind of took advantage of it. What the heck's happening in the UK? <laughs> you have a conservative government. When, when um, Margaret Thatcher was prime minister, she famously read Hayek. I'm not sure what Liz Truss and company are reading. What 
what's going on and what, and more important perhaps, what can we learn from that in other economies about what appear to be some policy errors? Um, there have been numerous policy errors made uh, by the new um, uh, government, um, but this follows policy errors that were made by the Johnson um, uh, regime as, as well. Um, I, I'm going to quibble a little bit, um, just to be provocative, with the use conservative. Um, I think what the trust government has done is the opposite of conservative. I think it's radical. I think it's related more to ideology than it is to economic policy. Um, they wanted to do something dramatic. Uh, the arrogance of the Chancellor of the Exchequer was extraordinary. Um, they were advised before they made the decision uh, about um, uh, you know, the changes last week. You know, what were those changes, by the way? Uh, they canceled some uh, uh, pending uh, tax increases. Um, they um, uh, basically presented um, a fiscally, I'm going to use a charge word, reckless plan. And they did it without details. Now, it's one thing to say, as they did, Ronald Reagan was right. You can have your cake and eat it too. Uh, but what they didn't do. He also had the reserve currency. He had another small. He had the reserve yeah. currency, and he had an economy that was doing okay. Yeah. Um, and that was very different. Um, uh, they have an economy that is on the verge of recession. Uh, they have an economy that is suffering because of the consequences from Brexit. Um, they have a currency that was not doing well even before this. And when they were discussing this, apparently, um, they were told that they couldn't or they shouldn't come out with a proposal that would do this kind of damage, potential damage to their budget, without laying out more details in terms of what the spending would be, where they expected the revenue to come from. Think of it as sort of like the CBO scoring that we do here from our Congressional Budget Office, which is you know, sort of like the fair referee who looks at the proposal and says, here's what the consequences will be. They were told they could have that available in time to make the announcement that they did before Parliament. And the <clears throat> Chancellor of the Exchequer said, I don't need it. I think he was wrong. Um, what have they done since? You may see that they have reversed course, saying, oops, we made a mistake. We shouldn't have lowered uh, taxes um, on high-income people. By the way, same thing that the Trump administration did here. Um, I happen to think it was not good policy. But they were following some of the things they had seen happen in the United States. And as Glenn points out, they did it without benefit of being the reserve currency. They did one other thing last week, um, which I found vexing. Um, and I actually don't know if it was covered uh, by the US press. It was certainly covered by the British press. And that is that King Charles was basically told he could not go to the climate summit that is being held. Um, now, if you're not familiar with it, when he was Prince of Wales, uh, Charles was vocal on climate matters. And uh, he had been invited to come and speak to the upcoming COP conference that's going to be held. And what I had heard from other sources is that when there, he was planning not to give his usual fiery comments about climate, but rather to follow the path that his mother had used. You may recall that the last time the Global Climate Group got together, they did so in, I believe it was in Cornwall. Yeah. In Cornwall. Um, and she gave, um, I'll, I'll call it, a very politic, even-keeled kind of statement about why uh, the world should get together to talk about uh, climate policy. And that had been his intention. The trust government told him not to go. Um, I think this is a big mistake. Um, and it kind of fits into um, what some people in Britain are referring to, arrogance. I think some of it also relates to uh, their rookies in terms of how to manage the government. 
um, and they're letting the ideology getting, get in the way of the pragmatism. Let me touch on two other areas. Well, actually, first, one more global and then two, two domestic. China-U.S. decoupling, how worried are you about that and what it might mean for global growth? Yeah, uh, I, I am concerned uh, about this decoupling. Um, and it's not just an economic decoupling. It is also, let's call it a geopolitical uh, decoupling. Um, you know, in my prior place of employment at Goldman, um, we spent a lot of time working with the Chinese government. Um, and you know, I've, I've personally been, I'm, I'm not a China expert, but I've probably been there 20 times. Um, and the discussions were always at, I would call it a very high sophisticated level. Um, the people who lead Chinese economic policy um, are extremely well informed, uh, very knowledgeable, well educated, and, and so on. And they were following the models of economic growth that they thought best. In some cases, it was the US. In some cases, they thought what Japan had been doing was good and so on. And in any event, there were opportunities uh, for other countries to participate in Chinese, Chinese economic growth. Um, the decision appears to have been made by uh, Premier Xi um, several years ago that he really preferred there to be a more domestic orientation uh, to their policy making. Um, and, and so what we are seeing over the last couple of years is just more extreme. Um, I, I'll give you a couple of examples of why the Chinese uh, might be more cautious now in dealing with the rest of the world. At the time of the financial crisis, um, every country, every developed country retrenched, right? Um, interest rates went up. Economies went into recession. The focus was on restoring the financial systems, the banking systems within each of the country. There was one exception. And the one exception was China. China was the one that provided, through its policy, economic energy to the rest of the world because they were stimulating. They were keeping their interest rates low, and they were also keeping uh, the renminbi uh, uh, under control. And the Chinese felt that they didn't get enough credit for that. Why is that an important observation? Because if you take a look at one source of irritation now that the Chinese have with the rest of the world, it is the perception that many of us have that the Chinese didn't handle the pandemic particularly well. And I'm referring here to the economic handling of the shutdown of various portions of, of the Chinese economy. The Sinovac vaccine probably has efficacy uh, based upon scientific literature of 25% or 30%. Compare that to the efficacy of uh, the mRNA vaccines being used here of 85 to 95%, J&J, uh, &J, comparable. Uh, but if you have a vaccine that's not very effective and you don't want to bring in other countries' vaccines, what do you do? You shut down your economy. Um, and the Chinese have been very sensitive to criticism from other countries about them doing so. And it was those shutdowns that exacerbated the supply chain problems everywhere else. So you have this friction where the Chinese are kind of annoyed that we're all annoyed at them, um, et cetera. Um, and, and you have, in addition to that, the conscious decision made several years ago that they were going to be focusing more on what they needed to do for themselves domestically and, and within Asia. Um, so when I take a look at this economic, less friendly approach, that bothers me as well, uh, because over the years, uh, the Chinese have been helpful um, in many circumstances. While they've not been heavily engaged in uh, many other parts of the world, they have participated uh, in a constructive way um, in, in various conflicts around the world and so on. And as a postscript, I would add the following. Um, I, I have researched and written on the topic of uh, Chinese R&D spending. And it has been miraculous um, in terms of, um, let me not use the word miraculous, I'll just say unprecedented, in terms of just how strong 
uh, Chinese uh, engagement in R&D has become over the last 10 to 15 years. If you go back 15 years, the Chinese were basically nowheresville in terms of global rankings and standings. Now, in terms of actual money spent, they're number two vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. Uh, so they've come from something like number 12 to number two um, because of the heavy spending. Um, they have done an incredible job in terms of educating the next generation of, uh, of engineers and scientists. Um, uh, they have uh, many more patents um, uh, available than m most of Europe, et cetera. You know, so they've done extremely well. Um, and congratulations on that score. What I worry about, however, back to the question of this competitiveness, is some of this improvement in Chinese standards have come about because of, shall we say, um, borrowing from other countries. Um, uh, 10 years ago, um, basically uh, copying a lot of uh, Japanese industrial uh, machinery design, um, then um, you know, getting involved in some of the biomedical uh, research that's being done around the world and so on. Some of it is not, um, does not originate in China. Let me, just, let me just put it that way. So that is one source of contention. The other source of contention, quite frankly, is militarily. Um, the argument had always been, um, uh, for example, going back to the Clinton administration, the Obama administration, um, that we could have a strong economic relationship with China and uh, basically economic policy with state policy, with foreign policy. And then, of course, this has now changed. We take a look at the big increase in Chinese military spending, um, and this has raised uh, concerns as well. I want to do a quick lightning round for sh your short thoughts on two areas, and that's just a signal to you to be thinking of your questions. One is ESG, with which I know you have a nexus from, from Goldman days. Is it the future, or is it just trade-offs? And the second is crypto, which could mean anything from distributed ledgers to blockchain to Bitcoin. What's signal and what's noise? Yeah, um, I, I think ESG is real, but not necessarily the way some uh, are practicing it. Um, I think there's an incredible amount of greenwashing out there. Uh, and that, that troubles me because I think that many people would, would agree uh, that there has to be an increased focus on, on ESG, uh, the environmental um, uh, standards and, and, and so on. But I think what many um, uh, money management firms have done is they're using this as sort of a branding uh, to accumulate assets under management uh, and they're not really uh, managing those assets as carefully uh, as they need to. Um, prior to the pandemic, um, the analysis that I did basically said that if you looked at things industry by industry, you can't do it across the whole board, but if you're comparing companies in energy and companies in electric utilities and just comparing them to other companies in the same industry, uh, what our work found is that the companies that were really cleaner had higher PE ratios, they also had lower cost of debt capital. Um, and by the way, they also tended to pay more attention to other governance matters. So I believe that there really is ESG. By the way, the data in the United States is not as strong as uh, comparable data in places like Australia, uh, where they have been paying attention to this for a longer period of time, or in some countries in, in, in Europe. So ESG is real, but you have to be careful. Crypto? Crypto. Um, crypto is something that, um, I think took on a life of its own, uh, in part because there's really no way to value it. Um, it was a story. It still is a story in some regards. Um, before you think of me as you know, just um, not with it, um, I have a degree in, in computer science, right? So I understand blockchain. Um, I understand how valuable those approaches are and so on. That's real. That's real. Um, um, uh, I'm a real believer in fintech. Um, I'm a real believer in electronic payments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the crypto coins, how do you know what it's worth? It's worth what somebody says it's worth. Um, 
you know, it's, it's sort of like me looking at a Picasso, like, I don't know what it's worth. Um, I, I need somebody to help me understand what it's worth. And so there's a question of, you know, buyer beware. You know, if somebody else is willing to pay that much for it, that's what it's worth until it's not. Um, and I think that's, that's what we have um, all found out. The other aspect of, of crypto that has troubled me greatly has been the energy and efficiency. Um, I think it's simply outrageous uh, that so much energy gets wasted um, in, 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 in the mining of, of this stuff. There, there are better ways to approach this. Um, and um, I, I think that in some ways we're due now for a reset. You know, we have uh, Bitcoin having come down so much. Um, I don't understand why there should be that much interest in Bitcoin when there are now other more effective coins available than Bitcoin. You know, um, I, I don't want to you know, go too far afield uh, on this, um, but if, if you're really interested in, in reading what I consider to be the most recent Bible on it, um, Eswa Prasad um, uh, at Cornell and Brookings uh, has written what I think is like the best book uh, that discusses crypto within the context of currency writ large. Uh, and, and I think there's some, some great material in there. So now I'm going to open it up to you. Anybody with a question for Abby, raise your hand. We've got Chazen team members with a microphone to help you. Anybody have a question? Yes, sir. On the edge. Ryan, you're going to get your Fitbit steps. Hi, thank you for your time. <clears throat> Just a quick one. You were talking about inflation and the implication in the markets and how the rise in interest rate has provoked a, <clears throat> a, a quite interesting fall in, in equity valuations. I come from Argentina, so I'm like an expert in inflation. And of course, our, our capital markets are quite smaller in terms of the representation of the GDP, and it's not comparable with the US. But there is a dynamic that it's sustained there, and I still don't see it here, that if we are projecting a decade of inflation in five, six, seven percent as a stable point, that means that if the return of the S and P or whatever does not match five, six, seven percent, we are actually losing valuation. I don't see that dynamic yet, and I think that markets like do a decent job pricing like future trends and implication and rates. Do you think that there will come a time where the benchmark is not the S and P, but the S and P netted from inflation, and there will be a change in the way funds and everybody reports their uh, uh, performance? Yeah, uh, great. Uh, I love the way you frame that, which is which is exactly right. Um, you know, s something that um, uh, Glenn and I were discussing the other day is the fact that there is such um, an interest interesting um, group here um, at Columbia of, of people who have grown up in environments where higher inflation is the norm. Um, and, and policymakers and civilians who have that as their background really are approaching this very, very differently. Um, fr from a mathematical standpoint, <clears throat> there would be a problem uh, in the S&P 500 if, in fact, let's say, I'll use your number, uh, inflation were 7% and earnings growth uh, was not 7% or better if you were starting at fair value. If you're starting undervalued, you could in fact have um, a little bit of tailwind uh, helping you. In terms of my own expectations, I don't think inflation stays at 7%. Um, I think we're more likely to be around the 4% level if you give me a couple of years. Um, uh, as, as that sort of time horizon. And I also think that with inflation of 4%, the nominal earnings growth uh, for the S&P could easily be 8% uh, and, and maybe higher. So it basically says to me that if inflation does in fact stay around that level or lower and we avoid a dramatic recession, then the S&P is okay. Not on an everyday basis, obviously. Um, I think that we have seen the end of these extremely low volatility markets, um, both fixed income um, and, and, and equity. Um, the big step up um, in valuation swings is now, from my perspective, in fixed income, uh, because um, we haven't seen the end of it. You know, we see what's happened in treasury markets and tips and so on. To me, the real 
pressure points are going to be the credit markets and also what happens in terms of the structure uh, on the balance sheets of financial institutions. Um, I, I don't think that's over, and I think it has uh, quite a ways to play out, and, and I am concerned about that. Uh, I'm glad that the regulators are looking at it. I think they're a little bit late in coming to it. I think that, for example, the SEC action against Kim Kardashian uh, was a year too late, and I think they were wise to pick on her because she has so many followers. But there are plenty of other celebrities, plenty of other... Well, Matt Damon um, got off. Yeah. He focused on Kim. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he may not be totally off. But there are so many influencers out there, um, you know, people on the radio and so on, um, who, who basically know nothing um, and are out there pitching this stuff. And um, that, that, to me, is, is, is problem, problematic. Um, I also think the regulators, just back to the, the point of valuations and so on, um, I think the regulators um, um, should be looking at uh, the banks very, very carefully. They do, of course. Post the financial crisis, uh, they have many more tools now than they had before uh, to make sure that bank balance sheets are, in fact... Uh, Just quickly on that point, do you have a feeling that a major bank or non-bank institution was swimming naked? We're going to find I th out. I think that some of the Europeans were, yes. Okay. Other questions? Sir, right here in the front. I'm going to pass him the mic there. Hi, Abby. Thank you for wisdom sharing. Uh, I'm David, the second year MBA student. And Slow down, please. Second okay, MBA sorry, MBA. sorry. Yeah. Uh, Abby, thank you for your sharing. Uh, I'm David, the second year MBA student, and I come from China. I want to ask a question, uh, maybe is uh, uh, about uh, politics. This summer, I do this. I do the summer intern in Johnson Johnson in Shanghai office. I find that in the future, uh, from the CEO and entry level leaders, they will make a challenge is about the culture or maybe tell the American headquarter what happened in China, especially for the limitation for the politics and on the on any other uncertain factors. So do you think in the future, uh, there will be uh, more, more international companies will choose to reduce their sharing in China market or they will make some change to share the, the uh, new challenge in China. Thank you. What do you think? <laughs> this is back uh, to the decoupling argument again. He's asking about firms. What do you think? Uh, to be honest, I think that uh, I think it, it's a very important question, especially for CEO. I have talk this 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 uh, topic with the uh, CEO from Johnson Johnson Medical Device, but uh, I find that no one has the answer. Everyone wants to try, such as on the one hand to, to persuade the American head counter to make some change, but to be honest, the price, maybe I think that in the last 20 years, they can have the same product, same price, and the same market entry uh, for all the all the countries, especially Asian countries. But now I think that maybe they are making some change, but no one knows their answer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, and, and that's a great way to start. Nobody knows the answer. Um, what, what we are seeing um, in so many places around the world, China included, um, is that uh, companies are trying, are testing the waters uh, to see what kind of pricing flexibility they have. Um, they're also testing the waters to see what kind of power they have with regard to supply chain. Uh, and that's something that is relatively new. Um, you know, U.S. companies and many Europeans took for granted that things would go smoothly. You know, we had just-in-time inventory, we had just-in-time ordering, and I think we also had just-in-time people. Um, and that's no longer the case anywhere. So, so that is something that we're seeing from, from a global perspective. Um, in the United States, um, we are not. Um, from my mind, fortunately, seeing pushback uh, against imports. Um, I think that would be unfortunate. Um, I'm, I'm basically, um, I don't want to call myself a free trader, but you know, somebody who thinks that um, when countries are connected economically, that is good news, uh, because um, <coughs> I, I, I believe that history shows that when there are economic connections, there's also more peaceful connection, and I think that that's what uh, we all need to be aiming for. Um, the thing that I'm seeing among U.S. companies um, is that there is not as much of this uh, reshoring as, as 
people talk about. I, I don't know if you're yeah. hearing the same thing. You know, in, in the media, you hear about, oh, we're going to bring back, you know, everything from Asia. Uh, I, I'm not seeing that, quite frankly. It's really just moving it from China somewhere else, but That's not right. here. Exactly. So we're seeing, uh, for example, uh, and this was happening pre-pandemic, right, um, going to lower cost places uh, in East Asia, including Vietnam. Um, uh, but, but some of the sensitive issues, some of the sensitive material that the argument has been, well, we need to produce it here, a lot of it is actually going to Canada uh, and Mexico. Um, so the, the expression that I think is very helpful is nearshoring. Uh, rather than reshoring, it's nearshoring. Uh, so we're seeing some of that, but that in some ways um, applies only to certain uh, items. The one item uh, where I am hearing from people I speak to in Washington where there is concern has to do with computer chips. Um, and it's going to take a long time uh, before the United States can reconstitute its chip manufacturing businesses. Um, so in the meantime, you know, continuing strong relationships with Taiwan Semiconductor, Samsung, and, and so on. And um, a company just announced it's going to be building a fab in upstate New York. I'm trying to remember what uh, Micron, Micron made that announcement. Uh, but it's going to take them 20 years. Um, and um, they're, they're building it, interestingly, in a suburb of Syracuse, New York. They've said that um, by the time they're finished, they will be employing 50,000 people in this new fab. Um, I looked it up this morning. It's Clay, New York. And Clay, New York has a total population of 56,000. Um, so I think a few other people are going to be moving, uh, moving to the area. So it's, it's not going to be overnight. It's, it's, go, it's going to take a while uh, for this to happen. OK, so property in Clay, that's one of your tips for today. <laughs> Anybody else with a question? Or any place else in Onondaga County? Yes, right, uh, right there, a hand that was straight up. I'm going to raise it so she can give you the mic. Hi. Uh, so I, I had two questions. Um, one was like a quick clarification question. Um, the, so you said uh, there was two P, like, are we going into a recession or not? Um, the S&P 500 like had good valuations. And then before that, you mentioned there was another piece um, that was maybe not looking so good. I kind of missed that. Could you, you recall? I'm, I'm trying to remember which question that was. Consumer sector? OK, I think, OK, Nancy knew. <laughs> um, and then so my second question is actually much more um, kind of like theoretical or think. So we talk the uh, intellectual property theft that you mentioned happening with China, right? Like that stuff has been happening throughout history, right? Like Germany, um, when Britain was the first country that, that had the industrial revolution, Germany went and like stole all kind of manufacturing stuff. Germany made it actually much better, which is just what Germans do. And, uh, and then Britain went and stole back um, the better manufacturing from Germany. Um, actually, Hamilton, probably our most famous uh, attendant, a student of Columbia, he actually encouraged um, intellectual theft and to bring, he even uh, um, offered asylum to people uh, from Britain to like start, you know, textile manufacturing in America. So all of this is not new, right? And sometimes we like want to scapegoat China as like, for whether it's bigotry or even just straight up racism, right? It's like China is doing this and it's un, like it's unprecedented. It's not. So how do we kind of change the framework where it's not about these countries' intellectual theft against each other, but how do we work with each other to kind of, you know, encourage um, R&D, encourage um, collaboration across nations and not painted in this light of intellectual theft? Um, I did not intend it to be racially charged, um, as, as you suggest. Um, the, the degree of IP theft going on right now um, has happened. IP theft has happened before, but not to the scale. It's quite significant. 
um, and um, much of it is happening um, in advanced manufacture um, and in scientific work. And one of the, the things that um, is interesting, of course, is that there has never been a country as open with regard to some of the solutions you suggest as the United States. Uh, no other country has had as many foreign students or, or as many postdocs um, as the US because we are blessed to have such a strong tertiary system. Um, in addition, uh, no other country has focused on um, uh, col collaborative work as much as the United States. If you take a look at journals, uh, scientific journals, and uh, do a scrub to see who has co-authored with people from other countries, the biggest collaboration is the United States and China. All right, I'm very proud of that fact, okay? 35% of the scientific articles written in the United States, published in the US, 35% of them have Chinese co-authors. Um, and, and that, to me, is quite impressive, and, and I think that that should continue. The issue arises when some of that intellectual property, some of the property that has been paid for uh, by the US government or by US companies finds its way into uh, production in other places um, that are ignoring things like patent protection. Um, to, to go back to the Hamilton case, the patent system was not quite as advanced as it is right now. Um, and by the way, it wasn't just uh, textiles. He also encouraged coppersmiths to come from Britain so that there could be better roofs uh, in, in, in the colonies. So uh, yeah, there's, um, there, there's a history of trade uh, among nations and so on. Uh, but there also has to be, I think, um, a recognition that there is, under rule of law, uh, proper protection. Um, and, and, and that's what I'm concerned about. One thing we're not going to steal intellectual property from is your next class. So we're going to have time for one last <laughs> lightning round question. So it'll be a short question and a short answer. Sir, somebody all the way or back. somebody, um, well, you, you pick, because it's the last all question. All the way in the back. All right, it's going to be then the person all the way. Because I, I want to see Ryan run up those steps. <laughs> oh, OK, great. I appreciate your time. I, I appreciate your insight earlier about discount models, cap and models uh, over accounting for interest rates being kind of sticky on, on the back end. So in your shoes, or if you took your experience, put, put yourself in our shoes, what model or adjustment of those models should we be pitching to our bosses if we go into IM? What's the model of the future? Yeah, um, that, that's, that's a terrific question. Um, I actually follow about 12 different models at any particular time. If I had to use just the one, it would be sort of the standard discounted cash flow model, the CAPM model. Uh, because I think it incorporates not just where you are right now, but where you're likely to be. So if you incorporate, for example, what you think the terminal growth rate will be on earnings, let's call it five years out, and you apply an appropriate expectation for uh, five-year yields or seven-year yields, that to me typically gives uh, the, the best explanation. However, there are exceptions. Uh, and there are some industries uh, where the analysis evaluation doesn't work so well with a discounted cash flow model. Uh, you certainly don't want to use just a DDM model because some companies don't have dividends. That's why I, I prefer the, uh, the cash flow. Um, but if I take a look as well, not just within the US capital markets, but around the world, and say which are the models that work best, uh, there has to be some adjustment in terms of where those countries are, in terms of their own economic development, uh, and just how far you want to go in terms of, is it a five-year horizon? Is it a three-year horizon? Um, and in some cases where there's an, an enormous amount of volatility, um, it, it has to be shortened up somewhat. What's but, not to like about a hymn to discounted cash flow? Join me in thanking Abby Joseph Cohen. <laughs> and stay, uh, stay tuned. Watch the Chazen website for information on another uh, Global Markets event. So enjoy class, and thank you, Abby.